drill for eight years now. I learned from uh, John McPherson, uh, Nathan Pummel, and Travis Henry in Randolph, Kansas back in 2016, I think. Yeah, 2016. Uh, so, uh, in this class we're going to be going over the basics of making primitive fire. We're going to be doing basic knife work while you make your own sets. I'll walk you through how to make a proper tinder bundle in my way, because my way is a little bit different than somehow uh, some other people prefer to do it. And I'll go through basic technique all the way up to more advanced techniques like uh, compound hand drills and floating. Uh, so to start off, uh, has everybody seen a bow drill? Knows how that works, knows what it is at least. Alright, so the hand drill is similar, uh, but you only have two pieces. Can anybody guess why a hand drill might be uh, better for a class or for a practical application in some situations than a bow drill? You don't need any more material than Okay. It doesn't yep. have the string and the spindle that's going to whack you. <laughs> yep. You have less <coughs> materials here uh, that you need to gather. Uh, you don't need to worry about making cordage. It takes less space. What else? Ease of convenience. Convenience. What about these? What about a knife? With a bow drill, you're going to be using a knife for the entire process. Uh, it's very important that you have one, otherwise it's going to be very hard to make a fire. With a hand drill, you don't need a knife. You just need a rock. A nice rock like these uh, flakes of flint are very helpful. But you can even use just a piece of sandstone. That'll take a lot longer, but it'll work. If you're trying to make a bow drill set with just a rock, you're going to be in for a very long, exhausting, frustrating day. So the hand drill, uh, to give you guys some history, uh, is suspected to be the oldest man-made fire source in the world, other than chasing around lightning strikes. Uh, there's a lot of speculation as to how it was discovered first. Um, it could have been something simple, like a kid was uh, playing. Um, my theory is that someone was trying to actually physically drill through something, drill through a piece of wood, and they happened on accident to make a fire. They'd probably seen smoke plenty of times, but it, it had never happened before fully. Um, so those are just two theories. There's a lot more out there. Uh, a lot of ancient cultures have creation stories with fire. I can't remember which tribe, I'm thinking Cherokee, but I could be wrong, so don't quote me on it. Uh, but there are a few tribes that have creation story uh, with fire based on the fly. Because when a fly lays and sits down on something, it's going to start rubbing its hands right away, right? That's the same motion that we do here. Uh, so the fly is one of the earliest fire starters in uh, some traditional cultures. That's pretty cool, I think. Yeah. So, a hand drill set is a spindle and a fire board. Uh, the, the spindle oftentimes is going to be some kind of woody flower stalk. Uh, in this class I have horseweed and seep willow for you guys to use. These are, in my opinion, the two best materials you can use in the U.S. Horseweed and seep willow. Horseweed and seep willow. So I've got examples of those uh, to pass around. Um, I'll pass around two full sets. Uh, where does the horseweed grow? Horseweed grows all over the U.S. That's why, in my mind, it's the best. You can find it all the way up to Canada, all the way down to southern Texas, coast to coast, it's everywhere. You'll see it often along highways, or, uh, fields that haven't been maintained. Um, along highways though is especially common because you'll see it just driving past and once you can identify it, you're going to be seeing it everywhere. Same with mullein. Mullein's pretty good. Uh, it's a little more temperamental. Uh, so I'm going to pass these around. I'll pass one set each way. This set has a horse sweet spindle and this set has seep willow. This is a cottonwood root fire board on each one. So go ahead and look at those. Where does the willow go? The seep willow? So seep willow, uh, this is a specific uh, desert southwest plant. It needs to be in a cottonwood willow riparian zone uh, between two and 7,000 feet generally. Uh, you can find it in some very rare cases outside of that growth range, uh, but that's generally going to be it. Uh, seep willow, uh, the name implies it's a willow, but it's not. Uh, it's actually in the, I believe, the lily family. Uh, it'll grow similar to willow, where it has big shoots that grow up straight or straightish, and then with narrow leaves uh, in an alternating, not necessarily symmetrical pattern. Uh, so it's easy to confuse it for willow if you don't know the difference between the two plant species. Um, but in terms of its actual combustibility, seep willow is much, much. Uh, lower combustion temperature, it's a lot easier to use. 
Uh, we could use the willow from around here to make a hand drill fire, but we're going to be working really hard. And it's going to be really exhausting and not a lot of fun. Do you have any mullein uh, spindles? Um, not in my stuff here. Yeah. Uh, actually, yes I do. I, so this small hand drill set here, this is a mullein spindle. Wow, cool. um, but it's fully scraped down, so it's not going to be good for identification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, in this class, we're mostly going to be using seed willow and horseweed for spindles. I have, uh, I'm going to have you guys probably using yucca uh, for most of you, uh, yucca or sotol. I don't have a ton of cottonwood root left, uh, so I'm trying to hold that one back until people are having trouble with the other materials and have that be a substitution. Um, so for now, uh, we're probably going to be looking at yucca or sotol for your fireboards, which are also desert plants. You'll see soap tree yucca growing all over the country. Uh, it doesn't grow as much in the northeast, but pretty much everywhere else, uh, some species of yucca can grow. Uh, the yucca that I have here is from uh, southern Arizona, uh, near the Mexican border. Uh, it grows pretty large diameter down there. Uh, the sotol is the same way. We're going to be using these here as a group hand drill later. Those, uh, your, those, the yucca fireboard is from a spindle of yucca? Uh, it's from a stock. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so these are Sotol. Uh, it's a cousin of yucca. Uh, we're going to be using this for a group fire later on today. Uh, this is going to be the first fire that the class makes outside of my demonstration. Uh, Sotol and yucca are cousins. Uh, they grow very similarly. I wish I had brought a leaf of each to show the differences in that. Uh, but you're going to have to just look those up on your own time. I don't have examples of the leaf or the plant for the growth patterns. Uh, but yucca and sotol have fairly low ignition points, making them really good uh, for hand drills in general and especially for beginners. So I'm going to go ahead and start talking about tinder real quick here. Um, I'm going to make a tinder bundle for you guys as an example, and you'll be making your own later in the class. I'm going to be using uh, the cambium bark of a cottonwood tree uh, because that's what I brought. Uh, I just don't have a lot of it. So I have a big bag of juniper bark that Dave Westcott provided uh, for you guys to be using for your tinder. Uh, juniper and cottonwood are both fantastic tinder materials and both will work very similarly. So I'm going to move these out of the way a little bit so you guys are able to see what I'm doing. Uh, so with tinder, uh, if you're ever hiking, backpacking, uh, out on a survival trip, whatever situation, you want to grab tinder when you see it because you don't know that it's going to be where you're going. Uh, this is a big thing. I guided wilderness therapy for a few years and took a boss course this summer and it's something that I always will harp on because you might be in a fantastic area for tinder in the beginning of the day, but then as the day progresses you might be moving to a different growth region, a different uh, microclimate, and you might not have those materials. Like say here, we're in a nice aspen grove, we've got willows, we've got cottonwoods, and demonstration sake as well. So I'm going to make a wad about the size of my hand. You can make it as large as your forearm, depending on how large of a tinder bundle you want. I'm going to start grinding it against itself. You can do that in small circles, or you can just grind it back and forth. Both ways work well. Um, I alternate, normally I'll do circles, and then I'll do back circles, and then I'll grind it. That's just roughing up the material, exposing more fiber, and creating more fine surface area. It's really important to have those good fine materials for the coal. If you think about a coal, it's going to be like any other living thing. If something takes a bite of something too large, it's going to choke. That coal is going to be the same way. Think of it like a baby. Babies need baby food. You don't give a baby a steak because that baby's not going to be able to eat it. It's going to choke. It's going to go out for lack of a less, or to keep it from a less morbid turn. So I'm going to process this down, and this is pretty fine already. If I were to drop a pole in this, I could bring this to flame no problem. So I'm going to make this a little bit rounder. Now I'm going to take my longer strip. I'm going to wrap this around the outside, pulling it fairly tight, but not crazy, because we want to have the ability to have good airflow. I'm going to tuck the tail in somewhere. Now that's not going to come apart. So that's solid. I'm going to take my thumbs and open up the middle of it. That's going to create what I call the target area. I got the term from Cody Lundin. He probably got it from someone else. Uh, in any case, the target area is where our coal is going to go. But before we call this done, we're going to get this fine material out of the middle. And 
we're going to add it into our target area. That's our baby food. See how this is so fine and powdery? That's what we want. Because that coal is just going to be ground up dust, uh, basically. So we want to give it dust to feed on first. So now this is done. This tender bundle is mostly uh, going to be considered medium material. I normally will use coarse material for the outer wrap, so that's what the strip is. I didn't process the strip whatsoever. The middle has to be that fine and ultra fine powder. So I'm going to set that off to the side, and I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate the hand drill for you. I'll show you a few different stances and uh, the basic technique. We'll go more into technique later on when you guys are starting to work on your sets. But for now, I'm going to set this stuff off to the side. I'm going to be using Sipuilo on Sotol, or Sipuilo on Yucca, so the same materials I'm having you guys use. A coal catch is very important. Uh, you'll make one naturally when you're making your set. It's just a chip of material. Uh, some people will carry a dedicated coal catch. I generally don't carry one in the field uh, because you can improvise it pretty well most of the time. You just want it to be sturdy enough to hold your coal, not crush, and not burn away. Uh, you also don't want it to be something that will conduct a lot of heat away from your coal. So you're not going to pick up a wet river rock. That's obviously not going to work for you. But a thin wood chip, uh, some people use the blade of their knife. Um, I have a friend that makes coal catches out of copper. Because copper doesn't conduct the heat very quickly, so it still works. Uh, this one's a little on the thick side, so I'll probably have to balance the other side of my fireboard. So to start off, just like with a bow drill, we need to make a pilot hole. Somewhere for the spindle to be sitting in so we can get a good burn. <coughs> so, I set my pilot holes about an eighth of an inch away from the edge of the board. If you're using stone tools, you would want to set it closer so you don't have to cut as deep with your stone. I'm just going to drill a small round indentation. And with yucca, it often will uh, tear out a little extra chip. That doesn't really matter. You just want to keep this round and about the same size as the tip of your spindle. So, see just with a few seconds of knife work, the pilot hole is ready to go. So there's a few different stances that you can sit in uh, while you're making fire with a hand drill. The sitting stance is the most basic. You just pin the fireboard under your foot. I like to use my heels. Some people use the arch or front of their foot. I find the heels the most comfortable. And you're just working out in front of you. So the downside to that, is you have no upper body weight on top of that spindle. All that force is having to be exerted out your arms. It gives you no mechanical or muscular advantage whatsoever. Next is going to be the kneeling stance. This is the same stance you'd use for a bow drill. Uh, it's just a little bit modified. So I have my knee cocked out to the side so I can work inside my leg. And this is a really good stance. You can see my shoulders are pretty much above my spindle here. That gives a lot of ability just to sit here and work. That gives automatic extra pressure as well because your upper body is pushing down on it. And then the third way is going to be the assisted kneeling stance. And for that, you can use another piece of wood. I use my machete a lot. You're just going to put it on there and put your knee on top of the, your board. Uh, I call them a kneeling board. You can call it whatever you want. And now you can just sit up here and focus. You don't have to worry about where your leg is. I like the assisted kneeling stance a lot. Um, when I can use it, I do. Another thing to mention real quick is your stance might uh, be determined more by your own build and the size of your materials. If I'm using a really small hand drill like this, I'm not going to be kneeling because I'd have to be crunched over so far, it's very inefficient. You'd be laying down. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, with small materials, I like the sitting stance a lot better because I can just have it right in front of me. And for small materials like this, you're going to be floating, which I'll teach you guys later on in the class. Floating is an advanced skill. I don't expect anyone to master it in this couple hours. But we will touch on it, and I will have you guys practice it just for sake of learning. So I'm going to go ahead and use the standard kneeling stance uh, just because it's generally one of the easier ones for people. Uh, before I start, a lot of the time people are going to have trouble with their hands slipping on the spindle. There's a lot of workarounds for that. Uh, you could lick your hands, spit on them, dip them in water. Uh, you can use drier uh, materials for grip like uh, pine pitch. You would crush it up in your hand and work it on the spindle. 
Uh, you can do the same with white ash from a fire, which we have plenty of because we have a lot of fires going around camp today. Uh, so that would be a good option for you guys. And in that situation, you're just going to get a handful of it and work it into your spindle. That will add grip for a longer term. Pine pitch does as well. You just don't want to make it too sticky. Otherwise, it's going to be pulling at your palms and that might blister your hands quicker. I'm going to use spit because we have spit naturally anyway. You don't have to do anything extra to get it. You don't want to be hawking a loogie. That's going to be way too much liquid. That's going to make it really slippery. If your hands are really slippery, it's going to take a second to dry them up enough to get good grip. So right now, I'm warming up the fireboard with floating. That's moving one hand up and one hand down in a circular motion, and I'm exaggerating it right now. When I'm actually doing it, you don't really see much dipping. See that? Looks like my hands are pretty much just sitting in place. Floating's great. So I'm going to make a pass down, okay. and when I have my hands near the bottom of the spindle, you pin it with your thumb, pin it down at the top with your other hand, and you can keep going. I have it burned in, so I'm not going to make another pass to waste more material. So when you do your burn-in, you always want it to be the same size as the tip of your spindle. If you're not burning the full diameter of your spindle, then you're not going to be able to cut your notch to the right depth. You're going to be playing a guessing game, and that guessing game often goes poorly. So always burn in to the full depth. I set this one a little bit further in than I had anticipated, uh, so I'm going to have to carve it a little bit deeper. It won't be a problem uh, for me because I can carve it deeper, but depending on your material and if you're wanting to line up both sides, it can be a problem. It can get in the way. So if you look at my fire sets, you'll see that a lot of my notches are square in shape. I learned square notches from Cody Lundin. Go ahead and pass those around and look at the notches. Uh, a square notch will give you better surface area contact between the spindle and the punk. That's important because without that surface area contact between the spindle and the punk, you're not going to get a coal. Or if you do, it's going to take a lot more work. It's going to be really exhausting. You're going to wear yourself out. So all square notches start triangular, so I'm going to bisect the hole and finding the middle point and making a mark. From that mark, I'm going to be going in on both sides at an angle <coughs> to make my guide. So the front of this notch won't be getting any wider than it already is. I'm going to ride those lines down the front edge of my fireboard. And now that's going to be the total width of my notch between those lines. It's not super wide. I don't flare it out at the bottom. Some people do. I think it's a waste of material and a waste of time. I've never noticed any positive benefit from it, so I don't do that. If you've done that for your bow drills or other classes you've taken, that's fine. It's just not something that I do. So you do what you want with your sets. So now, because wood is just a stack of fibers, it's a bunch of layers, in my opinion, one of the best ways to cut a notch is to press and rock, press and rock, and pop out chips. Think of it like if you're trying to cut a book. Say you're going to the corner of a book, you're not going to be sawing on it, right? You're going to be pressing down. If you're sawing, you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to maybe get a couple layers and then your knife's going to dull out. Knives are important, we want to save the edge, so you want to do as little work as possible. So press it in, press it in, and that pop sound, that's the chips. We're going to keep on doing that until we get about 40% of the way into the middle of that hole. If I were to stop right now, I'm not even at the front edge, so of course nothing's going to happen, right? We're going to build up a lot of punk on top of the fireboard. It's not going to go into the notch whatsoever. It's going to be wasted energy. It's going to be sore hands, and it's going to be a disappointing day. So I'm going to keep on carving that in to about 40% to the center. So right where it is, that's an okay stopping point, but it's pretty narrow. Does anybody know why narrow would be a bad thing? It's difficult for the ash to collect. Okay. Anything else? It's hard for it to go through. Yeah, both those answers are right. So with a narrow notch, you're going to have material building up on top. The punk is going to build on top of the fireboard like it was when I was burning in. And it's not going to have as much of a channel to go down through. So I want that notch to be a little bit wider. Not quite the full size of the hole. 
uh, but fairly close. So now that's about where I want the notch. If you're ever unsure if your notch is cut deep enough, the trick that I figured out after failing seven times at a demonstration, which felt great, let me tell you, yeah. is you put your spindle in the hole and look at it from the bottom. You should be able to see about a third of that spindle. With pithy spindles, you should be able to see the pith. So right now, this looks pretty good, right? You can see, oh, not really. So looking at it, that's why we do it. That's a little bit shallow. So I'm gonna take it and do just a little bit more. It doesn't need to be much deeper, but just a little. And now it's done. And I'll check that again with my spindle, and I can see it, and that's good. When you look down your spindle, or look down your notch, I mean, you want to be able to see straight through it. You don't want there to be any wood built up here at the bottom. If you have wood at the bottom, the punk isn't going to be able to pile right. So it needs to be a clear channel all the way down the board. That makes sense? All right. Question. Answer. You made a statement, and I was floating in my head somewhere. You said you did a certain notch at bow drill. You prefer your notch to be, was it vertical? Yeah, so I like to keep walls straight up and down. I don't flare them out. Uh, some people will flare it out so it's triangular. I don't do that. I think that's a waste of material. Okay. I keep my notches pretty straight. Pretty straight, okay. Yeah. No and you'll see that on most of my fireboards. My notches are almost always going to be straight lines. Alright, so now I'm going to use my coal catch and put that directly under the spot that I just carved out. Thankfully the ground here isn't totally flat, so there's bumps. So I'm not going to have to worry about balancing out this side. When I did the class under the Russian olive tree the other day, the side was sticking this way up higher, so I had to put something under here to even it. That's not going to be a problem today, because there's a little bump somewhere in here that's helping me out. I'm going to make this look easy, and then when you guys are doing it, you're going to realize it's not. I only can make it look easy because I've done this a lot of times and blistered my hands a lot of times to get to that point. So I'm going to spit on my hands a little, that light lubrication just to get a little bit of grip. I'm going to warm up the set with floating. You guys don't have to float, but I'm going to recommend it. I want everyone to learn how so they at least understand the motions. Notice how I'm using long strokes on my hand. I'm not using these tiny little strokes because that's really inefficient. You're only covering a small part of your hand that way. So I want to be using long hands. And then real quick, before I keep going, everyone hold out your hand like this. Tighten your fingers back, arch them back. Feel the pad of your hand here. Feel how that's pretty tight. Now soften your hand. Feel how it squishes. You want that squish. If your hands are tight back, you're going to be rubbing wood on bone, and that's going to give you really big blisters really, really fast. So I'm going to get going again. I'm going to float it until I have some good smoke and then I'll make normal passes. So I'm seeing some pretty good smoke. Pushing down, trapping. And I have a coal, but I'm going to give it one more just to be safe. Your first fire of rabbit stick was so... Impressive. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be a record. <laughs> All right. So you see here, there's still pump collected on top. My notch was a little on the shallow side still. Uh, it's not a big deal because I got the coal. But if you notice that while you're going, you're going to want to stop and adjust your notch. So I'm going to tap the back edge of my fireboard and lift it away. And here we see our coal. I know I had a coal because I saw the dust smoking from the bottom in front of the fireboard. It wasn't just coming from the hole or from the spindle. So I'm going to feed it the rest of that baby food. And I'll set my set to the side. Now you can just breathe for a second if you need to. This can be tiring. It can wear you out. So if you need to take a second, go for it. A bowl this size will burn for about a minute and a half. Provided it's not really windy and it's not really wet. You'll notice I have a tarp down. The ground here is drier than it is in other parts of camp but dry-er and dry are not the same. So I'm going to take my tinder bundle to my coal. And remember, I have that spot that I poked in with all the fine material, the target area. That's where I'm going to drop the coal into. I'm going to carefully knock that in. 
And this fireboard likes to hold on to my coals, so I'm feeding it the extra. Now we're going to walk over towards the fire. I'm going to be protecting this from the wind, otherwise it's going to be in flame before anticipated, and that's not going to be as good for the lessons. That's because you get burned. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> so before walking over there, I'm just going to squeeze it a little. That way the fine material is folding around that coal and feeding it while we're moving. I'm going to protect it from the wind so that I can bring it to flame how I, guys want, how I want you guys to do it. Alright, so this is already burning pretty well, so I'm not going to have to work too hard with it. I'm going to let the wind give it a little bit of air right now. I'm going to wave it in wide figure eights with the mouth of the tinder bundle facing the direction that it's moving. That's important. It gives it a constant stream of airflow. Right now, I'm feeling it get hot, and there's the flame. Didn't have to work too hard because the wind's already helping out. That's so nice. You can put it right back out and do it again. Waving it harder this time, giving it more oxygen, more air. The more smoke you see, the harder you can blow, or the harder you can wave. So that was a pretty uh, easy demo. It's not going to be that way for you guys. So sorry to say. Let's go start working on your tender bundles and then we'll make your sets. Do you prefer that to blowing or waving through the air? I do. Have you lost any coals out of the bundle doing it that way? Not one. No? Because if you're holding it well, it doesn't give it anywhere to fall out. And if your tender bundle is well made, it's going to start biting into that right. fine material as soon as you drop it in. Alright, so I'm going to move some stuff out of the way here. I want everybody working over this tarp for everything that we're doing today. So, uh, the last class I didn't have a big surface like this down and there's a lot of wood chips over there and I don't like that. I want to leave it cleaner than I find it. So we're going to be working over this so that we can bring all the chips over to the fire throughout the class. So for now, if anybody has a bandana or a schmog, go ahead and get it out. If you don't have one, I've got a couple that I can let you guys borrow. <coughs> We're going to start making your tender bundles. Yeah. Anybody else need one? You can make lines up both sides. So pick whatever feels better for you. And then I'll show you the ways that we're going to process these down. Piece of yucca? All right, so I'm going to show you guys uh, the two ways we're going to use to process these down. So I'm going to borrow this log. And... All right, so there's a couple ways we can do this. Uh, one way is splitting off the outside edges. Most of this yucca and so tall will have pretty straight grain, so it should split pretty decently. So, using a knife that can take batoning, I'm not going to use that on my nice carving knife that I just got, but I am going to use it on one of my class knives, because class knives are okay to beat up. So I'm going to put this on one of the outside edges. This is a fairly narrow piece, so we're going to be splitting a board out the middle. If you guys got thicker pieces, then you can potentially get two fireboards out of each. So like that one, you might be able to get two out of that. So, I'm going to set this flat on the log, and I'm going to set the knife at about the quarter mark, and we're going to just tap it on through with the billet, and now I have a coal catch just off one of the splits. You're going to need to keep one of your splits to use as a coal catch. So I'm going to go ahead and knock off the other side. So now I have a thick board. This is thicker than I want. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to drive the knife into the log and we're going to make planing cuts. So the knife is in here pretty sturdy. We're going to just pull the material back and you can take fairly large chunks off all at once doing this. 
This is also a really good way to make sure you're keeping a flat surface. Because sometimes if you're carving, one side will be higher, one side will be lower, then you try to even it out and suddenly your fireboard's really thin. How thick do you like your fireboard? So I like my fireboards to be about a half an inch. Okay. And I can have my sets around so you guys can use that as a metric to go off of. Sure. Uh, these are all cottonwood root fireboards. Um, your guys' yucca and so tall can be about that same thickness though and it'll be fine. So I'm going to plane this one down, and this one can be an example piece as well when it's finished. You'll see that it's just shaving right off, no problems, no muss, no fuss. Alright, so... This is a little bit wavy right now, so I'm going to try to clean up the waviness because you want your fireboard to be as flat as possible. And this one might just want to be wavy. But generally flat is flat enough in most cases. So this is fine. Uh, this thickness is all right. Uh, main things is you want the top and bottom of your board to be flat so that it can sit flat when it's on the ground. So this one can be an example piece for someone. And then I'll toss a couple other fireboards around so you guys can use them as examples <coughs> of thickness. So uh, there are I think six logs, seven logs maybe. Uh, so there should be enough workspaces for everyone to use. Um, borrow or not borrow, share with your neighbors if you need to. I've got this one billet, uh, so this will need to be passed around so everyone can drive in a knife. If you don't want to drive your knife, use one of mine. I don't care if these knives get beat up. That's why they're here. So, I stole this from you guys, so I'll get it back. So with the thick ones here, yes. So, yeah, so for the thick one, you're gonna go down the middle, and then you're gonna uh, plane off the other side, and then still plane your split surfaces. Yeah. All right. So planing like this is a very safe technique. Uh, because it's very, very controlled. The knife doesn't move at all, that's why I'm teaching it. This is a basic class, so I'm teaching basic knife skills. I don't want anybody to have any accidents with it. And once we move this on to spindles, we're going to be working with stone tools. Uh, so, once you're done with your fireboard here, then you can uh, just hold it <coughs> for a minute and I'll go into what we're going to do for our spindles. That's a good branch, so it could be fireboards as well. Ideally not in this class, so we still have another billet, but good materials are hard to come by, so when you find them, you definitely want to get them. In this area, there's a fair bit of cottonwood around, so it's not as bad as in some other areas. Uh, it's a little on the thin side for it. I'd say go ahead and just knock off the sides. We'll get another billet going your way here in a second. slow with that. If you go too fast, you're going to get hurt. I've seen people before trying to plane and they catch the back of their hand. Like right back in here. That's not something you want to do. That's pretty dangerous. Then yeah, once your fireboards are cut out, uh, flatten bottom one of your splits so you have a good cold catch. Oh, no. Okay, I think. 
Don't make that any thinner. That's already perfect. Okay. Yeah, it'll sit flat, and that's all it needs. If you make that much thinner, you'll just burn right through. Uh, you can also square up your edges. Uh, that's always uh, something that can be done. I like square edges on my fireboards because it's better when you tighten your notch. That way, you have a straight line going all the way down it. And again, try to make sure all your wood chips are staying on the tarp so we can take care of those better later on. One of those, I think, was the example piece. I think it might be the one she's got. That one? Perfect. So, like I was saying, you can square up the edges. Um, I like to have square edges. Uh, if you split your board out of the middle of the stock, then you don't have to necessarily worry about that. It should be fairly square already. Um, you'll notice a lot of my fireboards are shaped or tapered at the ends. You can do that too. Um, it does uh, remove some usable material, but I like how it looks. Um, it is also traditional in some native cultures to have uh, tapered ends on your fireboards, kind of like a canoe shape. Uh, my thought is because it's easier to slide it into a quiver. I carry my fire sets in a quiver normally when I'm out and about with them. That's why you have a curved on the end. That's why I like that curved end. I was wondering. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Nicer it was a stylistic to thing. Drop yeah. it into something that, makes that sense. way. Yeah. That's still a little bit thick, uh, so make it a little bit thinner. I'll put a line on here and have that be the mark for you. I know that can be helpful for me sometimes. I would recommend more looking at other people who are to do it as a person to do it and at least people know more about this than I should. And we've got a lot of people working in a tight proximity with sharp tools, so make sure you guys are being safe and aware of where everybody is. I don't want anybody getting cut. The spindles that we've got here are horseweed, like this guy here, which is the most, uh, one of the most common materials in the country, and then seed willow, which is exclusive to the desert southwest. Yeah, seed willow can be found in California, Nevada, southern Utah, Arizona, and uh, possibly parts of New Mexico. Uh, whereas horseweed you can find pretty much anywhere in disturbed soil, so long as the conditions are right for it. So open sunlight, uh, the ground can be... Uh, so the seed willow, like I was saying, is only found in the southwest, and it's uh, really, really good. It's one of the better materials in the world and one of the best in the country. So it's a great option. We also have horseweed, which does grow a lot more frequently throughout the U.S. Um, got a couple bundles of that, some bundles that have a little bit of each. Uh, these are actually not good for class materials. They're all too thin. I just brought these in case people wanted extras for other stuff later on. So I'm going to get those out of there. Uh, so we've got two bundles of seep willow here, two bundles of horse weed right there. Uh, so everyone come up, um, pick a spindle. The longer the spindle is, the more rotational passes you're going to be able to make before you have to reset your hands. 
uh, the shorter it is, the more packable it will be. So if you're going to be carrying it in a pack or a quiver, a smaller spindle might be better. Uh, for general learning, long spindles are really good. That said, the longer the spindle is, the more likely it is to have some waviness to it, some curves. Uh, we can straighten them to a degree, but generally, uh, you want your spindle to be straight. Most of the class spindles that I have in here are going to be in about the 20 inch range, and that'll probably be best generally for everybody. In terms of thickness, um, I like about a quarter to three-eighths of an inch. Uh, anything too much thinner than that, and you can have your hands rubbing together a lot more, and that can cause faster blisters. Anything much thicker, and you're going to have to work a lot harder to uh, generate the heat you need to heat up your set. So come on up. This side is horseweed. This side is seep willow. Go ahead and take your pick. That's a real nice piece of horse meat. Come sit with me, Joy. A little bit of boat doesn't matter so long as the ends line up pretty much uh, together. Joy. And do you normally like the So look at this. That's our next step. Uh, it's a little on the thick side. That, let's see. What are you making? Jordan? Definitely got a bend. <coughs> Is a uh, yeah. Game, gamekeeper. Thing. What are you gonna put it in? <laughs> small, <coughs> uh, small stuff that he hunts. Oh yeah. I wanna put mushrooms in my foraging. Oh yeah, those big puffball mushrooms. Yeah. That one's a good one. <laughs> and that's probably one that I pre straightened, so it should be good to go. I pre-straightened a lot of them, but not all of them. Sure. So, like, slide it down. If it's mostly straight, it'll be fine. A little bit of wobble here and there doesn't hurt anything. Cheap uh, So long as the ends line up mostly. Enjoy. 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 Alright, does everybody have a spindle? No, I gotta go. Alright, come on up. At some point, someone saw that their noodles really like eating it, so that's why I got that name. And maybe got fat eating it? Maybe. Alright, so processing the spindles is going to be uh, with stone tools. So I've got a whole bunch of flakes of flint that Bo provided for us. Thank you, Bo. Um, if you've never worked with a stone flake before, there's a bit of safety that you need to consider. These are very sharp. These will cut you to the bone if you're not careful. She probably shouldn't do this one. Um, so you're going to find a flake that has a good edge. It'll hold up fine for what we're needing. We're not going to have to retouch them at all. So let's see. I'll find a spindle for an example piece here. This one. Yeah, that worked. All right. So. You're going to take a flake, find the sharp edge. If they have a little bit of curve in them, that can be helpful because your spindle isn't a flat line. It's got some curve to it. So we're going to take that and we're going to hold it straight up and down 90 degrees to the spindle and you're going to scrape. That's going to be knocking off those hard spots. On the seep willow, you're only going to have to worry about the spots where the leaf nodes are. Uh, you don't have to worry about scraping the rest of it so much. So you're going to find a flake, 
I'm going to scrape, get rid of all those hard points. You can do the entire rest of the process with a plate without much issue. So you're going to want to work down these leaf nodes. If you have a little growth on your spindle, uh, you can try to uh, chisel that one down a little more, carve it down. So go ahead and find a good flake here. They all will do the job. So I'm going to process this one down and match it up with the fireboard that I made earlier. I to keep that going with the demo. And generally it'll be easier to uh, scrape these from the direction of growth, so from thick end to thin end, uh, going up against the bottom of the node. Uh, if you're going the other way, it's going to want to stop, it's going to want to chowder a little bit. So you go from thick end to thin. As you're scraping the horse weed, you'll notice it's got an interesting smell to it. I don't know what that smell is, but it's kind of sweet. It's not bad. Careful with the flakes, like I said, they can cut you to the bone. You might not even feel it at first. Uh, once you have it down so that you can run your hand up and down the spindle and there's nothing too rough feeling, it's probably good to go. And then we'll be ready for the next step. Once it looks like everybody's about done with their scraping, I'll show you the next step we're going to do. And the next step won't necessarily apply to every spindle because I already did that on some of them. Yeah, pointing or flatting the ends. And that's okay. It's a rock. If it breaks, I can get another one. I got these from Bo at the floor napping area. Yeah, he's been saving a pile for me. Did you say, what was the angle you did? Uh, 90 degrees. Okay. And if you have a seep willow, then you only need to focus on the leaf nodes. Okay. In which case, you can just try to use the rock to carve them off like you would with okay. a metal knife. And I have seep willow. It looks like it. Yeah. And then, uh, for the seep willow, you don't have to strip the entire thing, but the bottom inch, uh, regardless of what spindle you're using, the bottom inch or so, you do want to scrape all the bark off because that'll make little helicopters as you go, and you don't want to have those helicopters, they can disrupt your dust pile. So scrape that bottom end as much a as you can. A helicopter just means stuff flaking off. Yeah, little like bits of bark that'll like curl up. Okay. Oh, got it. Yeah. Thick side is the bottom. The thin side is gonna give you faster rotation, so you want that in your hands, and the thick side will give more friction. So you're going to want that on the bottom. Yep, that's yucca. Do you gather these or do you get them from friends or what? Yeah, work your top side here. So you can <coughs> these sharp teeth nodes will work your hands out. Yep. And all the seep willow here was gathered along the Santa Clara River in southern Utah. That looks pretty good. Go ahead and get that knife sheathed and get ready for the next step. I have. I've 
taught at Fire to Fire a few times, and I've taught in wilderness therapy probably around 150 people. Uh, so, you're going to be looking at these ones or these ones. But I think your mom already has the set that your family is going to be using. Alright, so it looks like everyone's about done with their spindle work. Um, and if you're not quite, that's okay. This next step is called the score and snap. Uh, we're going to be doing this with the stone blades as well. Uh, so what you're going to be doing is if you don't have two flat ends on your spindle already, or if one's pointed, that's fine, uh, flatten the other. You're going to take the stone blade and you're going to saw a line going the full diameter of the spindle on the same plane. So you're going to saw it all the way around. And then you're going to do that all the way around until you've broken through the wooden walls of the spindle and you can snap it right off. The score and snap technique is a really good one. I do it with my knives all the time, but I think learning stone tools is important with ancient skills like this. For, the, for which end? Uh, so both ends. Yours both actually ends? already has two flats, so it's fine. If you okay. want to practice it, you yeah. can, but you don't need to. Uh, yeah, yours want, is fine. Do you want flat ends? Yeah, one end will need to be flat, one end will need to have a dull Excellent. point. Uh, so if it already has a dull point on one end, you can leave that at the other end is flat. Like, this one has two cut ends, so this one needs to be adjusted with scoring. And even using rock like this, you can do this work fairly quickly. Like I haven't been working on this too long and it's already about ready to be snapped off and cleaned up. And it breaks off clean. You don't want to have a cup. actually start working on it, I'm going to take this point down so it's more rounded. Uh, but yeah, this feels pretty good. There's one rough spot right there. Is that okay. Yeah, that's good. That's ready to loose. Oh uh, yeah, go ahead and just like flatten that. Do you, um, do you make multiple holes, like how your kits are already made beforehand for yourself usually, or are you just doing that? For... I do them one at a time. Yeah, normally. okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. like these ones are all pretty well used. Yeah. Uh, so they're all lined up pretty well, but you generally score just a bunch. one at a time. Yeah, okay, as yeah. you use it. Yeah. Uh, you can, like, pre drill all the holes yeah. if you want to, but you don't have to. Yeah. It's not like, required. Yeah. I wasn't Some sure if there's an advantage to that or something. Yeah. If that's what you're doing. Like the only just advantage would just, just be that you don't have time, to do it obviously. next time. Yeah. yeah. But it only takes a few seconds totally. to drill a pilot hole. Yeah. Even with a stone knife, so it's whatever. Uh huh. Yeah. Not really. Um, like, uh, there's an anthropological text called uh, Fire Making Apparatus in the U.S. National Museum. Uh, big name for a book, uh, but it's free source, uh, open source, you can download it online for free from Project Gutenberg, I think, and uh, a few of the examples there are wrapped with leather on the fireboard to keep those spots dry. That's really all it needs. As long as it's not sitting out in a downpour, yeah, that's probably fine. So, how many uses do you get from you have any idea out of a fireboard? Like um, 
Depending on the material, I can generally get two fires per spot. And, um, with a soft piece of sotol, it might only be one. With a good piece of cotton fiber, it could be three. Uh, so it is very material dependent, but generally, I'd say two is a good uh, number to go off of. And then if you uh, want to learn uh, score and snap with a knife, it's pretty similar. You're going to take your knife, edge up, you're going to have your thumbs on either side, you're going to push down on the spindle and rotate it, and that's going to be cutting through those woody walls, and it'll snap off clean. It takes a lot less time with a metal knife. Yeah. So, our next step, once you guys have your spindles all cleaned up, is going to be pointing an end. And a lot of these spindles already are pointed on their bottom end, so that's not something you're going to have to worry too much about. Uh, so, you're going to just want to give it a dull, rounded point. Like, it doesn't even have to come to an actual point, it just needs to be round. Because that's going to be close to the finished shape once it is burned. And you want to give yourself as little work to do as possible with it. Fire is already a fairly difficult skill, and so if there's anything you can do to make it a little easier on yourself beforehand, you always should take that advantage. One last step for your spindles. Um, if you have horse weed, this step might already be started for you, uh, but you want to drill out the center of it just a little bit. Um, it doesn't have to be a ton, but if you're thinking about uh, a cylinder spinning, the middle isn't really doing that much if you're spinning, it on, uh, spinning on a surface. It's going to be the outer sides doing it a lot. Think of it like an auger. Um, once you have a hole started with an auger, it's the outside edge doing all the work. So like stalks that are like pithy in a way. Yeah, pithy materials. Like a lot of hand drills are going to be made of a flower stalk. Yeah. Sunflower is a pretty decent one too. Mullen is a good example. Yeah, mullen, sunflower, goldenrod. They're all going to be fairly pithy. Seek willow is pithy as well. So you want that out in the middle just because you want less. Yeah. You want most of the work being done in the outside. Exactly. So you're going to be reducing negative friction in yeah. the center and, and increasing your positive, positive friction on the outer edges. Makes a lot of sense. It's almost like it's meant to be dug out. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> I've never done that before. That's really cool. Yeah, it's not something that I've done a ton until the last year, and yeah. I'm still not really sure that it makes does that anything? much of a difference. Yeah. But, I mean, Holiday does it, yeah. and he's very good at this stuff, and has been doing it for a very long time. Yeah. So I'm going to go with what Holiday likes to do, <laughs> because that man is almost never wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when it comes to something skills based. Yeah. So at this point, everybody should have their set pretty much finished up. Um, if you still need more time, that's okay. I'm going to talk to you guys more about floating now uh, because I want you guys all to practice that motion. You don't have to master it in this class. I don't expect you to. It took me a long, long time, several years, to get good at floating. But it's a good skill to have, and I think it makes hand drilling easier. So, I'm going to go ahead and just start a pilot hole on my fireboard here. And again, when you start a pilot hole, it should only be about the size of the tip of your spindle. You don't want it to be oversized, and you don't need to dig it very deep. And then when you have it uh, drilled out, Check it with your spindle. Your spindle should be able to turn in it without popping out at all. And now I'm going to teach you the motion for floating. I got really good at it by washing my hands with this motion because that's something you do several times a day, so that really will develop muscle memory. So to float, you saw me doing it earlier, you're moving one hand up and one hand down simultaneously. By the time you get to the center of your palm, your hands are turning. And exaggerate it a little bit while you're learning it like this because you'll learn that motion. 
when you're actually doing it, it's going to be less exaggerated. But when you're learning, it's okay to make those big hand motions. Exaggerated is better than underdone because you'll be able to figure it out once your hands are on the spindle and you'll be able to adjust. So with floating, and actually I didn't have you guys do this earlier, uh, so with your spindles, go ahead and clamp your hands on them as hard and tight as you can, and then push them down. Your arm should shake how much pressure you're pushing. That's the force that you need to be applying with your spindle. And don't be doing that in the grass because you're going to get dirt all over them and polish up the ends. That's a lot of force, right? That's what you need to be applying. So with floating, you're going to be keeping your hands in one spot on the spindle. Or at least if you're doing it right, you are. And I need to adjust the end of my spindle because it's riding right out that thing. need to round that bit more. I want everyone just to practice that floating motion for a minute and try to understand how it works. Your hands are just kind of spinning there. You don't have to be using much pressure yet. Once you get good at floating, you can float out a full coal with practice. I got my first fully floated coal about a year ago on this set and it was a very powerful feeling because I had gotten my first coal over seven years before that. And so going back to that feeling of first fire was incredible. And it happened in a time where I really needed that fire, which made it all the more important for me. So I'll show you guys with this set, because this one's so good for floating. I'll just notch it real quick. And then uh, this little one here, I made on my horse with Boulder Outdoor Survival School this summer. And this spindle was only maybe two inches longer than this when it started. That's a pretty small spindle. So floating was very, very important because you can't really make many passes down a spindle like this before your hands have to reset. There's a, another technique called walking your hands up the spindle that you can also use with small ones like this, and that's really cool looking. Didn't Not you necessarily do that? practical. Didn't you do that? I didn't, but I can show it. With the first fire? Okay. No, I didn't uh, walk my hands at all. Okay. That's something I'm not great at, but I do like to practice once in a while. It's easier for me with smaller spindles because you have less distance to go. So let's see, do I have a tool here ready to use? Yes, I do. So for the notch here, what, what, is the, what are the parameters we wanted to think about when we're making this notch? So the pilot hole, uh, keep it about an eighth of an inch away from the edge of the board, depending on how thick your spindle is. If your spindle is a little bit thicker, then back it up a little. And then don't drill it too deep, and only make it the size of the tip of your spindle. So like this spindle here is forearm length. That's something like, I don't know, like, 12, 13 inches, uh, so that's pretty small for normal hand drilling. You can still do it with a spindle this size, but floating gets really important with smaller spindles because you need to have as many rotations as possible. So I've already got a spot burned in and notched here, so I'll show you guys a floated uh, hand drill, and maybe I'll get lucky and float out a full coal for you. So you'll notice I'm sitting with this. This is a small spindle. If I'm standing or kneeling with this, I'm not really going to get much. You're getting a smoke. You're getting smoke. Mm -hmm. So you saw I did one pass, because when you do full passes, oftentimes you can get more pressure than you can when you're floating. So that's the only reason I did that. I probably had that goal before that pass. So I'm going to put this one out, because I don't need this goal. It must have been great for you on the boss course. I provided the first few fires. Yeah, I was going to say. Alright, so before we do individual practice like this, I'm going to have us move into group hand drilling. So, earlier I mentioned this big Sotol set. We're going to use this for the entire group. 
so I'm going to teach you guys how to make a fire in tandem. Everybody's going to be taking turns on this. So, if you guys still have any stone flakes, that's fine. Uh, just put them back here when you have time to. Then we're going to make our group fire now. So I'm going to need a volunteer to start a pilot hole on this, and it's going to need to be right in the center of the stock. <coughs> Anybody want to do that? Alright, so go ahead and drill a pilot hole about this size in the middle of the stock. You can line it up with that other one. So what we're going to be doing here, like I said, is a tandem hand drill. Tandem means you're working in time with another person. So I'll be holding your fireboard down for you guys, and everyone's going to come and make passes down it. Uh, someone, I can't remember who, made an extra tinder bundle earlier. Uh, so we're going to use that, and if there's not an extra anymore, that's fine. I can make another one. Uh, but once we get this pulled as a group, we're going to... I made it after I talked to Dave Holiday about them. I had seen a video where he talked about them with another friend of ours named Tyler. Uh, it's something that he just had in his office while he was working with Tucson Public Schools, and he made his first coal on one of these. This thing's huge. Not easy to just make a coal on your own with it. So that's why I'm having you guys do it in tandem. So we've got our pilot hole started on here, and that should probably work. So I'm going to be over here. I want everybody to line up and just loop around and we're gonna have everybody make passes down this. Right now we're just gonna be burning it in. So as soon as it's got a good burn going, uh, we'll notch it and then we'll have everybody keep on going around to generate a coal. After we get the group hand drill fire, then it goes to individual practice. You guys ready? All right, let's get this thing burned in. Like it, Mom? So everybody <coughs> line up. We'll get going on this. It's very important that the spindle doesn't pop out of the hole. So when you get to the bottom, I'll take it and I'll hold it for the next person. When you have your hands on it, then I'll take mine off and you'll get going. I need a line, not a big old blob. Everybody line up behind Andy. Going for a burn in. So just remember to lock your hands, throw your back back here, up, use fit to give yourself some grip. And I'll hold it to the bottom like this for everybody. Make sure you're pushing real hard. These are boat drill size materials, so they're going to need a lot of pressure. Alright, that's good stuff. Next. Alright, Dovey, you ready? Alright, go ahead and spin. And make sure it stays on the fire board, okay? Go. Good, 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 good. That's right. Alright, good job. Next. Not quite burned yet, so let's get going. We go back to the end of the line, or are we done? Right, good job. Next. You'll probably want to take off the ring if you can, just so you can use more if you can. You know, first. So first, I will go ahead and go next, and then have it ready next time. No rings. No rings. Very nice. Good speed. Next. This squeaking that we're hearing means there's not enough pressure. So make sure we're pushing real hard. Next. Oh yeah. Alright, so we've got our burn in. So I'll go ahead and notch it. So Go ahead and clap your hands real hard if you've already done it. That'll get the blood flowing better to them. So you're not going to be like blistering quite as much. Remember, while you guys are getting ready to make your next passes, keep your hands soft, not stiffened out. Go from about the heel of your hand up your fingers. I stop about here. Go further if you can.
So I'm going to go ahead and carve this in. Careful there. <laughs> And when this notch is carved, I want everyone to take a look at it. Because that's going to be what you guys are need to be carving your notches like too. Uh, yeah, one at a time until the coal is there. And I'm not going to tell you guys when the coal is there. I want you guys to call it. So you're going to be looking for that black dust pile in the front of the notch, smoking on its own. That should be about good. Alright, so this is a squared notch. goes almost to the very center. And it's fairly wide at the front. That's what you guys are going to do on your fireboards too. So I'm going to put a coal catch underneath. And we're going to get ready. And I'll have you guys go. I'll keep holding the fireboard for you. And we'll be going one at a time until someone sees and calls out the coal. And I'm going to hollow out the tip of this as well. All the way at the top. That way you can get the most rotations. Good, you see that still? That's good. Alright, next. Good. Next. Smoke. Yeah. Dad, we gotta get back in line. Oh, huh? get back in line. <laughs> Next. Nice, look at that, pumping out. Take it over. Right, next. All right, now be ready. Go. Make sure you push it real hard. Push it down. Give me one more try then. Good. Doing good, buddy. All right, next. Nice, Push it down, Dina. Push it down as you're spinning it. Careful. Push it down. Like, 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 your hands in the same spot. Yeah, just yeah, hands like this. Down, and so hard. Like, like this. Yeah. Alright, good job. Next. Good one. So what we're doing right now is traditional within the context of a hand drill. It's almost never in history going to be just one person doing it. It's always a group activity. Good, good job. Alright, next. Alright, don't get back with your parents. So we have a full notch of dust at this point, so we just need to get it to ignite. And as long as we're staying in the hole, it's not losing heat. If it pops out, we lose a ton. You're okay. Yeah. All right, keep next. Going, going. Jump on it. All right, Joe. Let's see it. Next. All right, you guys see what's happening right now? Yeah, it looks like it's ready there. You guys see a coal here, right? Yeah. Yeah. See that? All right. Let's go ahead and stop here. You guys did good. Last group took about five, six minutes. You guys took about four. All right, so we've got a real small tender bundle here. I'll hold it in my hands. Everybody's gonna blow on it. 
So we're going to go back to the main fire. So let's head that way. But you're just chewing up that so tall. <laughs> Gonna protect this from the wind so the wind doesn't do our job for us. <laughs> Alright, everybody. The wind might just bring this right to flame. So I want everybody over here all at once blowing on it. Small breaths at first and then more as we go. Ready? Cool. Flame. Did you get it? Flame! Oh, go. Keep on going. We're not there. Yeah. The more smoke you see, the harder you can blow. Go, go, go. Come on. Got it, bud. Hey, look at that! Good job, guys. Now we know it works. Alright, now we can move on to solo practice. Fire. 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 Fire.